It's hard to know exactly when it was that Utah Governor Spencer Cox changed his mind about voting for Donald Trump. He revealed this fact a few days after the former president had been shot in Pennsylvania. Someone asked Cox at a press conference if he would cast his first vote for Trump this year, and he said he would, which was a shock to the political community. Remember, Cox had been a holdout on the MAGA movement. He spoke out against Trump's character and rhetoric. But the reporter McKay Coppins says something about seeing Trump get shot shook Cox or moved him or something like that. If you uh, want to really see something that said, take a look at what happened. Oh. The night that Donald Trump was shot at the rally in Butler, Pennsylvania, Spencer Cox was at home in the governor's mansion in Salt Lake City. He was on the second floor residence, which is where the governor and his family live when they're there. And he told me later that he was just kind of pacing back and forth, scrolling obsessively on his phone for updates, watching the clips of the shooting. And he's looking at the photos of the former president's bloodied face. And he told me I was kind of captivated, but there was this sick feeling pit in my stomach. It's interesting because Cox had, for years now, become increasingly worried that America was sort of careening toward something like a democratic breakdown. You know, he had studied the literature on polarization and political violence and extremism in America. And as he was watching the coverage of this shooting, he had this kind of nagging fear that the bullet that had barely missed Trump, that had it been just a few millimeters to the left, it would have killed Trump and started a civil war. He told me this feeling was still with him when he went to church the next morning. And while he was sitting there, he had this idea come to him that he should write Donald Trump a letter. After church, he climbed into the back of an SUV and it started heading toward his hometown of Fairview. And he told me that there's this stretch of the drive where the cell phone reception disappears. So he took out his iPad and just started to type this letter to Trump. In the letter, he writes, Your life was spared. Now, because of that miracle, you have the opportunity to do something that no other person on earth can do right now, unify and save our country. By emphasizing unity rather than hate, you will win this election by an historic margin and become one of our nation's most transformational leaders. You know, Cox would later say that he didn't expect it to become public, but it leaked within days. Governor, you had a big change related to President Trump in the last week. Explain that. Well, so sure. Uh, and the day after Trump gave his speech accepting the Republican nomination for president, Cox held a press conference. My lifetime since I was a, uh, I was a little kid. I and he I was, was asked specifically if he planned to vote for Donald Trump in 2024 for the first time. Cox had never voted for him, and Cox said that he would. And so that's uh, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing everything I can to, to help and support him. Uh, we'll, we'll still have lots of I was watching all this happen actually and, uh, from Milwaukee. We'll I have been in Milwaukee covering the RNC and. I had actually been talking to Cox on and off all year for this profile that I was planning to write about. Him. And I had been given no indication at all that he would do something like this. I mean, literally in our conversations all year, he had been pretty critical of kind of Trump style politics. He had made very clear that he was not part of the MAGA movement. And of course, for years, he had been critical of Donald Trump. 
So when I saw him, it was actually the day after the convention, I was flying back to DC. I saw that he had done this, that he had endorsed Donald Trump. I kind of felt like, all right, I have to talk to him about this. I need to kind of sit down and understand what he's thinking. So a few days later, I flew out to Salt Lake City and met him at the governor's mansion to talk to him about it. This is Radio West. I'm Doug Fabrizio. Today in the program, we're talking with McKay Coppins about his recent article in The Atlantic called The Last Man in America to Change His Mind About Trump. It's an examination of Cox's change of heart on Trump, or at least the way he's explaining or justifying his endorsement. Coppins says Cox has a strategy in mind, a calculation that he shared with him. And whether or not you think the governor's motives for endorsing Trump are principled, when you consider just the basic political consequences, he didn't have to do it. That's what, to me, made him an interesting subject, right? (laughs) Because we know the story of the Republican politician who is facing his own primary challenge. And so he buckles to conservative pressure and endorses Trump for for his own political reasons, right? Yeah. Now, that's not to say Cox didn't have his own political reasons. We can get into that. But but like he had already won his primary. And as you know, in Utah, when you win the Republican primary, you're on your way to statewide reelection. Right. Like that. That he, he did not need to pander to Trump and his supporters at that point. And so that that to me was the first indication that there might be kind of something more interesting going on here. And, and, you know, I I will also say, like, Cox is somebody who he he thinks a lot about uh, his place in the party. Hmm. And for a long time, he seemed to almost take pride in the fact that he was outside of the the kind of Trump movement. Um, Yes, it made his life difficult. And Yes, I'm sure it's not fun to get booed at the Republican Party convention in Utah. But like he um, he seemed, at least in my conversations with him over the the past year, to actually uh, be be kind of happy about how peculiar he was in the Republican firmament. And so that that made it even more surprising that he would take this turn. So that that's part of why I was so interested to talk to him. Well, it seems like to that point, it seems like Spencer Cox kind of tapped into the idea of being weird before Tim Walls did. <laughs> Except that he wore the weirdness yeah. uh, as a badge Himself. of honor, right? Right. right. Um, well, and he had, you know, he gave um he he gave the state of the state speech you know, earlier this year in January, where he he kind of framed the whole speech around this idea. He said, we're weird, the good kind of weird, Mm -hmm. the kind of weird the rest of the nation is desperate for right now. And actually, that was going to be one of the themes of the profile I was writing, Mm -hmm. because, you know, he was very proud of this weirdness, this Utah weirdness. And and I think, you know, he never said as much, but in a way, he, he almost seemed to emblematize it, right? Like he was the personification of Utah's idiosyncratic conservative politics. And, um, you know, uh, he had become increasingly anxious about whether Utah's idiosyncratic politics could withstand the pressure to basically Trumpify, right? Mm -hmm. As, As Trumpism was seeping into every crack and crevice of the GOP throughout the U.S., um, a lot of our conversations were about his anxiety that Utah Republicanism was going that same direction. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, to see him then endorse Trump was pretty surprising. You say that he had immersed himself in the literature of polarization and political violence. So it seems like he has this almost academic examination going on about polarization, how it works. Um, and I'm wondering if he said much more about that. Did Is he looking at philosophy? Is he is he drawing on his own sort of LDS spirituality? Do you, it, what, what do you understand about that part of it all? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, he, I mean, I, I think actually if you've watched any of the speeches he's given and the work he's done on the Disagree Better initiative, 
some of the interviews he's given, he, he actually returns to this theme constantly. Like this idea that, uh, you know, so he draws on sociologists, psychologists. Um, he, you know, talks about the concept of healthy conflict or productive conflict. Um, he also draws on religion and spirituality. And, uh, you know, he, he we talked a lot about the idea of loving your enemy and what that exactly means. And um, so he he like it, it is a, a point of um, I don't want to say obsession for him, mm. but it is like probably the issue that he thinks the most about outside of, you know, day to day governance in, in Utah. Like he is constantly thinking about the division in our country, how it's being exacerbated by our politics and how to to reverse the trend to the point where it, it was funny, like a little thing that didn't make my peace, but that I thought was funny. You know, I asked him if he had watched the presidential debate between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Hmm. And he said, oh, I haven't watched a presidential debate since 2012. Wow. And I, I was kind of surprised. I was like, well, you know, you're a professional politician. Why don't you watch these debates? And I, I, I was and he was like, you know, I, I just can't stand them. Um, I like he, I think his words were, um, you know, they make me angry and they don't they're not productive. And I feel like a worse person after watching them. So that's all. Hmm. <laughs> so but but it, you know, speaks to just like how much these ideas of um, of polarization kind of uh, influence him, not just in his his politics and and in his speeches, but even in like how he spends his time and how he lives his life. McKay Coppins, he's a staff writer for The Atlantic. His latest article is called The Last Man in America to Change His Mind About Trump. We have a link to it on our website, RadioWest.org. We'll take a break. Come back in a moment. You're listening to Radio West. This is Radio West. I'm Doug Fabrizio. Today in the program, we're talking to the reporter McKay Coppins about his new article in The Atlantic. It's about Utah Governor Spencer Cox's decision to endorse Donald Trump for president. Coppins is asking how one of the people in the small group of office-holding Republicans who hadn't signed on to the MAGA movement had talked himself into supporting it. I want to ask about your interview, the the particular interview you write about. Uh, You you met Cox, you say, Sunday afternoon. You're there in the governor's mansion. This is in July. What was the tenor of the the, the interview that might have been different from other conversations? This one seemed not not contentious. Um, He he, he quibbled with you a little bit. Maybe he, he had before, but I'm wondering if he's feeling defensive or like what was the relationship like the sort of journalistic subject relationship like here? Yeah. Well, he's, I mean, anyone who's met him knows he's like a very friendly guy, like kind of over the top friendly, right? Like it's, he, he smiles a lot. He's very, you know, enthusiastic. He's happy to see you. So our relationship up to that point had been, you know, relatively friendly, even Mm -hmm. while understanding that, you know, I'm a journalist and he's a, a politician. So there's, inherently some adversarial aspect to that relationship it was always very friendly and when i got to the governor's mansion that day um just a couple days after he'd endorsed trump i would say that he still you know was uh you know making a show of of being friendly you you know welcomed me Mm -hmm. into the governor's mansion shook my hand uh brought me to his study showed me around a little bit like it, it wasn't it wasn't adversarial right from off the bat but i did tell him early on in the conversation you know, look, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Yeah. And I'm going to, you know, I think a lot of people are pretty surprised by this decision. And a lot of people are angry about it. And I'm just going to run through some of the arguments that I've heard. And I want to get you to respond to it. And to his credit, he was pretty game to do that. He yeah. was like, absolutely, let's do it. Um, what was surprising, I think, to me was just frankly, how transparent he was about the calculation he was making, mm-hmm. right? Like, mm-hmm. I, I don't want to say he was defensive. I, I think he was actually quite candid with me, and I, I give him credit for that. But, you know, he was not in that interview heaping praise on Donald Trump. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, he he rejected the MAGA label. He said that Trump and J.D. Vance 
were antithetical to his brand of republicanism. He even uh, at a, a couple points kind of s- seemed to quibble with the idea that he had had endorsed Trump at all. Like he, he said, well, you know, let me just be clear. I said I'm going to vote for mm-hmm. him. I didn't say I support everything he does. I'm not even telling you that you need to vote for him. Yeah. So, you know, the, it, to me, that was the sign of somebody who like he didn't he, he didn't want to seem like every other politician who sells out to Trump and just immediately, you know, starts fawning over him and, and you know, saying the exact opposite of everything that he'd said before. Like Cox was very sensitive mm-hmm. to the impression that he had just followed the same trajectory of as, as every other Republican and seemed pretty determined to make the case to me that what he was doing was different. Yeah. It seems like what he's trying to say is I've come up with what I think is the strategy that will work. Um, and we'll get to that in a minute. But I wanted to back up for a second and give a little bit more context before we get there for Utah and, and Donald Trump. Because you do this in the piece, an important part of the story you tell is what seems to be the kind of evolving relationship between Utah and Utah Republicans, including Utah Mormons, and, and of course Donald Trump. 2016, as you mentioned, it seemed like Mormon voters in the country in Utah were not going to get on board with, with Donald Trump. Um, as you mentioned, in Utah, he placed this a distant third in the state's Republican primaries, only got 45 percent of the vote. 45 percent of the vote in the general. In the general, in the, right. right. That's yeah. critical, right. And people wondered why, at that point anyway, why Utah hadn't become Trumpified, as you say, including, including you. you. You wondered yourself. Yeah. And so you write about the fact that journalists had come up with all these theories. Do you want to share your own theory for what was going on then? This was part of what drew me to this story, you know, because, you know, to the extent that I knew Spencer Cox had this anxiety about uh, Utah's politics sort of following the same trend as the rest of the the nation's politics. I had noticed just as an observer and journalist who had been writing about this stuff and covering it for a long time, I had noticed something changing in Utah Mm -hmm. as well. So back in 2016, you know, I think it was a combination of factors. And I don't know that I have the like exact, you know, recipe of which ingredient was most important. But I think that like, you know, a combination of Trump's personal life and vulgarity um, being offensive to a lot of, uh, you know, socially conservative Latter-day Saints, the fact that Utah's low income inequality and high upward mobility uh, make Trump's message of rigged systems, you know, not quite as resident. Hmm. Um, there, there's the difference in attitudes toward immigrants uh, in Utah versus other red states that make uh, Trump's, especially 2016 message, uh, a little bit uh, less impactful, right? Like Trump's 2016 campaign really was built on, um, you know, fear of illegal immigration and refugees. And he had proposed the Muslim travel ban, which, of course, the LDS Church came out and uh, responded to and condemned. And so you just had this really kind of unique cocktail of factors that uh, made Trump an unusually weak Republican presidential candidate in Utah. And, you know, as a journalist, I had covered Utah and Mormon politics more broadly and the religious right. And I had written a lot of stories about this and talked a lot about it on TV and the radio. I'm pretty sure that I've come on your show many times over the years talking about this stuff. (laughs) And so, um, so, you know, I think that part of what is so interesting is that like, Oh, you know, Donald Trump back in 2016 seemed to a lot of people like a fluke, right? Like, He had sort of hijacked the party briefly, won this nomination, um, but he seemed certain to lose. And uh, then the Republican Party would sort of snap back to the party of, uh, you know, Romney and McCain and Bush and, and Reagan. And that didn't happen. Instead, Donald Trump, of course, won and completed his conquest of the Republican Party. And, you know, eight years later, he has remained undeniably the most powerful and influential and important figure in conservative politics. And I think that 
that has an effect, right? Like there, there are consequences to that. And I think, you know, nearly a decade of dominance by Donald Trump has made a lot of the elements of the Republican coalition that were initially more resistant to his brand of politics, they've started to to give it right. Mm-hmm. Like the 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 bulwark, uh, those bulwarks, and and Utah was one of them. Mormonism was was one of them. Mm-hmm. There are signs that there's been a breach in the stronghold, as as uh, Spencer Cox actually put it to me. Cox has been sort of making this argument for for a long time that in some ways you know uh, utah and and mormonism in particular offered this antidote to the, you know to this poisoned national political landscape um is cox starting to think and this is how he maybe is why he is ditching the old strategy if i can put it that way and adopting something new that maybe that's not true maybe the utah model maybe mormonism isn't going to be the antidote that he thought it might be. Well, you know, he said something to me in um, in that interview, almost like as I was leaving, it was near the end of the conversation that I thought about a lot since then. And I wonder if this kind of helps explain his decision, which because I had said something like, you know, you can make a case that the sort of like communitarianism and moderation and pluralism are in in Utah's DNA in a lot of Mm. ways and that that's made utah less susceptible to the appeals of um you know xenophobia and demagogy and you know he actually pushed back on that and he said Mm -hmm. um i i don't know that it's in our dna i think it's actually a choice we have to make every you know generation every election cycle every year every day and what's what's you know again i i don't know how that shaped his thinking but I've thought about that a lot since because um, I do wonder if his faith in Utah exceptionalism has been rocked by this past year, the past several years, his own, you know, recent primary, uh, the magification of elements of the Utah Republican Party. Like, I I wonder if he is starting to question you know, I think he he clearly wants Utah to be a city on a hill. He yeah. wants, um, you know, Utah to be unique, to be weird. But he might also be realizing that, like, the, there are limits to how much that's going to happen naturally. And I wonder how much that that kind of influenced his thinking in deciding to join the Trump coalition. Well, as as you said a moment ago, he was really transparent with you, candid with you about this calculation that he has going on. And the calculation that he's making is sort of transformed in this kind of strategy. And I wanted to ask you about it. So he says to you that the Never Trump movement had, as you, as you put it in the piece, utterly failed, or maybe this, that, that's directly what he mm-hmm. had said, but that he had come to realize that he couldn't have any influence on the modern Republican Party if he wasn't on the team. Um, so talk about the calculation here. What's what's the strategy? How is he working this through now? Right. I mean, basically what he said to me is supporting Trump, voting for Trump is a litmus test in the Republican Party. And he said, I don't think it should be. I wish it wasn't that mm-hmm. way, but it is. Um, you cannot be taken seriously by the vast majority of Republican voters if you are not willing to vote for Trump. Otherwise, you're dismissed as a traitor, a never Trumper. Mm. Uh, you become kind of exiled like Mitt Romney and Liz Cheney and Adam Kitzinger and, you know, the, this handful of high profile Republicans who have been been fully excommunicated, basically, yeah. from the modern GOP. And what he says is, look, I, I don't want to become Liz Cheney. Um, I don't want a you know a cable news contract. I don't want to speak at the DNC. Um, he said, "I I want Republicans to listen to me." And he mm-hmm. he believes that this mission that he's on is more important than uh, you know pushing back against Donald Trump. But the mission that mm-hmm. he's on, and this is what makes him kind of so mysterious. This whole thing so strange and why I think it's invited so much skepticism is 
is to heal America's political culture. Like the his his you know disagree better initiative, his uh, efforts at depolarization. That is what he sees as his defining work uh, on the national stage, and he has basically decided, uh, at least this is what he told me, that he's willing to try to ally with Donald Trump. He's willing to throw in with the the Trump cause, the Trump movement, if it makes it more likely that Trump voters will listen to him and you know receive his message of depolarization. Is it? As simple as saying he's choosing between idealism and just simple pragmatism. Um, you, you have to sell part of your soul to be on the team, to get what you want. And this did make me also wonder if this was an insight that goes beyond just the country's political condition. Does he believe there's a larger spiritual dimension or lesson here? It does Again, does Mormonism inform any of this? Because the question of l- loving your enemy or dealing with your enemy d- does come up in all of this, it seems. Yeah, the, the quote that I, I use from the piece that has kind of bounced around uh, the people responding to it was pretty provocative, but he, he knew it was. He said, that love your enemy stuff, it sucks. I hate it. I <laughs> wish Jesus had never said that. Right. <laughs> but but what he was saying was that, you know, this he said this strange thing happens when you start to work on an initiative like Disagree Better and start to surround yourself with other people who are committed to depolarization and uh, improving, you know, political discourse, which is that you start to criticize the people who are polarizing the country and then they become your enemies. And he he said, you know, if you're not careful, you end up becoming a mirror image of the thing that you're working to defeat. Mm. Um, so then he he said, you know, to me, this is kind of the ultimate test. Like, can I uh, love my my political enemies? That is to say, Donald Trump and his most kind of outspoken and zealous supporters and set aside my differences with them in pursuit of this larger goal. Now, I did raise the obvious objection yeah. um, to that idea, which is that, you know, you can show Christian love to Trump and his supporters without endorsing Donald Trump for president. Mm-hmm. Like, of course you can. And I went through all the things that Donald Trump has done that Cox has found abhorrent over the years. And Cox, you know, was adamant that he didn't take back any of his criticism of those things and he hadn't changed his mind about those things. Um, And and he even said, you know, I'm not among those who think that Trump um, is, uh, you know, is is suddenly going to become a different person, that his moral character is going to change uh, after the shooting. Because you remember that that was kind of a meme in conservative circles in the immediate aftermath of the shooting, that he had found God, that he was, you know, different. And and Cox said, I'm not an idiot. The guy's 78. He's probably not changing. Um, But he did have this idea that by kind of changing the incentive structure, by going to Trump and saying, you know, I'm really proud of you for not immediately responding to the shooting with escalatory rhetoric and threats and anger. And because of that, I'm going to endorse you that, you know, Trump would basically like in, in some like lizard brain way, like start to say, start to think, oh, maybe by acting with more restraint and more moderation, I'll actually be able to attract more allies. Like Cox had this idea that he could help change the incentive structure for, for Trump. Um, and, and I think that that thesis that he laid out for me just a couple days after, uh, after his endorsement did not age very well uh, in the, in the coming week. Well, I think that's, it's important to say that it sounds like, Cox had just very bad timing or jumped the gun in his analysis because when he's thinking about writing this letter, you know, after the attempt on Trump's life, you you point out the atmosphere was completely – the landscape was completely different. Trump's Mm -hmm. leading in every major poll as you say. The Democratic Party was, was in chaos. It looked like a landslide was coming for the Republicans. So the question comes up then, does Cox 
regret it? Does he think, I blew it? Well, yeah. I mean, I I thought that that interview in the governor's mansion would be our last interview for this piece. And my plan was to basically go, you know, I was going on vacation with my family and then I was just going to kind of write the piece and uh, and that would be that. Um, But, you know, a few weeks later, as I sat down to finish the piece, I was going over the transcript of my interview and I, I, I kind of it occurred to me that a lot of the premises he was basing his uh, rationale on in, you know, the in late July had been overtaken by events. Right. Like Trump, for one thing, had shown no interest uh, in trying to unify the country. He had sort of returned to form. Mm. He was, you know, posting conspiratorial diatribes on social media about Harris's rallies and crowd sizes questioning her racial identity, calling her nasty. Um, He even boasted at a uh, rally in North Carolina that he's not going to be nice uh, anymore. And so, you know, Trump had basically uh, directly undermined the thesis that that he might respond differently to political incentive. Um, Also, as, as you pointed out, Joe Biden dropped out, right? Kamala Harris then took over. And uh, immediately went up in the polls. And and the idea of a Republican landslide is not really something anyone's talking about anymore, including Republicans. And so what seemed uh, in late July like a a tactic to help nudge the almost certainly future president in a better direction now seemed like a an endorsement of somebody who's in a very close race and who is is not really doing anything to uh to you know make the country more unified as cox had hoped so Mm -hmm. all of which is to say i I decided to call him one more time and kind of give him a chance to you know revisit some of those premises and basically asked him like do you see this differently or you know have you changed your mind about any of this and he you know he (laughs) he conceded that trump uh had reverted to his old habits he said he's playing the hits um (laughs) And he also said that, you know, he was not super optimistic that Trump would change like that. It was interesting because in that in that last conversation, that phone call, he almost didn't seem that interested in talking about Trump anymore. Like, I don't know if he was fully abandoning that thesis, but Hmm. he seemed pretty eager to change the subject. And instead, he he pivoted to talking about Trump supporters Um, Hmm. and you know, he talked about how he grew up in uh, in Fairview in rural uh, Utah, how the people there um, are very conservative. They're largely Trump supporters and how they had always distrusted Cox. And uh, his quote was, I really do care about them, but they don't think I care about them because if you're a never Trumper, you're the enemy. <laughs> and so his, his hope now was if he couldn't reach Trump or, or, you know, change Trump's behavior, maybe the fact that he was now on Trump's team would allow him to reach those Trump supporters in in places like Fairview, uh, where they wouldn't even give him the time of day beforehand. McKay Coppins, he's a staff writer for The Atlantic. His latest article is called The Last Man in America to Change His Mind About Trump. We have a link to it on our website, RadioWest.org. Take another break. Come back in a moment. You're listening to Radio West. This is Radio West and Doug Fabrizio. Back now to our conversation with the reporter McKay Coppins. We're talking about his new article in The Atlantic called The Last Man in America to Change His Mind About Trump. The story, um, a lot of the story anyway, is or gets to the question of of how Utah finally came into the MAGA Republican fold if it did. Um, I suppose that's a question, but as far as you can tell – has it? I mean, what's going on in Utah? One of the things you mention is this some survey data that that shows uh, uh, American Mormons were becoming um, 
less Republican overall in the Trump era, but the ones who stuck around were becoming Trumpier was the word they used. Right. So what what do we know th- that's going on with Latter Day Saints and Donald Trump and Utah and Donald Trump? So you know, in 2016, there was a lot of talk and hype about like, would the Trump era drive Mormons out of the Republican Party? Um, there actually has been some evidence that that's happened. Um, the there's a gender gap. Latter Day Saint women are more likely to have stopped identifying as Republican. In, in the Trump era, Latter-day Saints overall are identifying as independent in larger numbers. Some are becoming Democrats, but it, it more more commonly, they're just not identifying as Republicans anymore. So there has been some movement in the broader kind of American Mormon community. Um, it's also worth noting, I talked to a political scientist who studies religious demography. He said that Latter-day Saints are actually the only religious group that has changed significantly in the Trump era. So, um, you know, that that is an interesting phenomenon. But I think what do they mean? In what way? So, well, just in their in their party identification, Um, like the 2016 Mormon voters were, uh, uh, you know, the best data has Mormon voters, uh, about 53 percent of them voted for Trump. Yeah. Um, A typical Republican presidential nominee it would have gotten 70 to 80 percent. Um, so that that's a 20 to 30 point swing. Yeah. No other religious group in America had any movement really at all um, mm. compared with in terms of voting for Trump versus past Republican nominees. So so that is notable. But, you know, and this is this is, I think, the the issue that Cox is contending with those who have stayed in the Republican Party I think in 2016, 2017, um, 2018, you know, there was still this sense that they could remain Republican, but keep a distance from Trump and his style of politics. Right. Hmm. You know, 2018, you had Utah Republican primary voters nominate Mitt Romney as their nominee. Right. Um, So there there was still some room in, uh, you know, five years ago, six years ago for Republicans in Utah to uh, be stalwart Republicans, but not, you know, Trump supporters. That kind of never Trump Republicanism really seems to have eroded in in Utah. And um, and you see it, you know, in some high profile examples, Mike Lee being Mm -hmm. one, uh, you know, who has gone from being a Trump critic to one of his most outspoken supporters and allies. Um, and you see it in, I, frankly, you know, Spencer Cox's endorsement of Trump. I, I do think that there is uh, something happening to where if you are a member of the Republican Party um, in Utah or really anywhere else, aside from maybe some very deep blue states in the Northeast, it is not possible to stay away from the MAGA movement anymore, mm-hmm. right? Um, the, there's just the, any kind of notion that this is Trump is a fluke, that this the fever will break, all of this will snap back to some earlier version of republicanism. That's been totally annihilated by the past decade of American conservative politics. And uh, I, I think that that's, you know, probably part of what Cox is responding to. This is probably a digression, but here, here's something you 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 write in the piece. You say that for every Mitt Romney, it seemed there were now two Mike Lees. Um, to, kind of to your point, I did think you wonder, as someone who's written a lot about Mitt Romney, of course, and, and, and a good deal about Mike Lee, what's the difference between those two guys? They both share a faith. <laughs> they both had somewhat moderate but conservative fathers. Um, mm-hmm. Again, I'm you haven't written an article about this, but you did mention it. So I thought, I just wonder if you had any thoughts. You know, I think in some ways they are, they are similar. They come from the same faith background. You know, they sing the same songs at church. They hear the same talks at general conference. Like, you know, by all accounts, um, I I know Mitt Romney much better than Mike Lee, though I've interviewed both men uh, repeatedly. Um, you know, by all accounts, their faith is at the the center of their worldviews, and yet they've come to such dramatically different places politically. I think that, you know, part of this might be 
the um the difference in their relative appetites for power and you know desires to continue to rise in republican politics mm -hmm. um Mitt Romney is in the twilight of his career. Yeah. He's also had a series of kind of moments of reckoning, not to borrow the subtitle of my biography of Mitt <laughs> Romney, but <laughs> where he he's really kind of questioned uh, the Republican Party's uh, role in in what he considers a growing democratic crisis in America and has therefore been willing to stand apart from the rest of his party. He has plenty of money. He has his family. He is pretty secure in where he is and is thinking about his legacy. He's also, you know, decades older than Mike Lee. Mike Lee is somebody who clearly feels like he has a lot more he wants to do in Republican politics. Mm -hmm. He uh, wants to be a star in the GOP firmament. He, I think, you know, also... Uh, based on conversations I've had with people in his circle, he enjoys hanging out with, you know, Donald Trump Jr. and kind of being in the Trump orbit, right? Um, he's been welcomed in there. This is part of his circle. Um, I do think the other important difference is that Mitt Romney was never a movement conservative, right? So he yeah. always, he was a moderate Republican governor in Massachusetts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he, you know, ran twice for president, but always as kind of the more moderate choice. Um, Mike Lee sort of stormed into politics as this anti-establishment figure. And while his ideology has changed, I think you could argue pretty dramatically uh, from that Tea Party libertarian brand of republicanism to the pro-Trump uh, nationalist brand, he it comes from a same kind of angry anti-establishment uh, place that that I think has shaped Mike Lee's politics, and I think that also might contribute to uh, to their different paths. What has all of this done, do you think, to Cox's um, reputation among supporters? You say in the article Cox believed he could reach a new audience with this message, but with all he said, with his candor in, in talking to you and others about. You know, he's not exactly being coy about his strategy. Will he really now have access to the the MAGA base? And what kind of damage yeah. do you figure he's done to his own reputation of people who, like him, had always been skeptical of the moral character and political inclinations of Donald Trump? Yeah, well, I'll take your the second part of your question first, which is – and I think he would say the same thing, you know – the people who were working with him on the Disagree Better initiative, um, Democrats or never Trump Republicans or, or independents, they're pretty mad at him. Yeah. Um, and they feel betrayed and they feel like he abandoned their team to go, you know, join up with the with the MAGA movement. And I think, you know, I did interview a couple uh, of his friends who are Democratic governors uh, Wes Moore of mm -hmm. uh, of Maryland, uh, who actually just spoke at the Democratic National Convention, uh, Jared Polis from from Colorado. Both of them, you know, were polite about about Cox. They both said, "Look, this isn't going to change my friendship with him," but they were pretty, you know, to varying degrees, critical of his his decision and expressed strong disagreement with it. Other people have been much uh, less restrained um, and. And so I think it's fair to say that his credibility on those issues of kind of depolarization has been tarnished. Like there, there's no way around it, you know, endorsing Donald Trump for president. Um, it's just it, for a certain segment of the audience that he had, that's just a deal breaker. They're mm -hmm. not going to listen to him anymore. As for whether he will reach those Trump supporters, I think that the jury's still out. Like, I think we'll have to see. I, you know, I, I admire his, his optimism that he can reach them. I think you, you alluded to this, the fact that he was so candid about his, his rationale, um, does perhaps undermine the effort with, with some people. Um, you know, the, the fact that he continues to be critical of Donald Trump continues to say that he's not part of the MAGA movement, the fact that he kind of 
told me, look, I'm just trying to pass a litmus test here so I can move on and, and focus on the work I really care about. That stuff was all noted in the response to my piece when it came out. And I, I did note that a lot of the kind of like hardcore Trump supporters who the kind in Utah, especially who uh, voted for Phil Lyman in the Republican mm-hmm. primary there and uh, who were really did not like him. This didn't really seem to change their sentiments toward him. If anything, a lot of the reaction was like, look at this joker trying to pretend he's a Trump supporter. You know, <laughs> like yeah. it, it, did, it didn't seem like they were super eager to hear him out. But uh, but, you know, Twitter is like a it is not the best sample size. And uh, I imagine that uh, he's going to try to actually get on the ground in places like Fairview and and uh, and and talk to those people and. And we'll see if he can connect with them. Did you get any sense at all that he might be a little disappointed in himself for doing it? Ooh, that's a loaded question. It really is. Um, I, I, I don't know if I, I can read his mind yeah. quite that much. I mean, what, what I'll say about this is that I did ask him in that interview uh, at the governor's mansion, is there anything Trump could do that would change your mind, that would make you walk back your endorsement? Because you remember, he actually did this in 2020 when he was running in 2020 in the Republican primary. Right. He, he said he was going to vote for Trump. Yeah. And then he decided not to. And, and actually, when I asked him, you know, what was the thing that triggered your your withdrawal of your endorsement in 2020? He couldn't even remember. <laughs> he said, oh, I don't even, you know, there were so many things that happened that year. Uh, he couldn't remember. But he did. He, he had not, he has never voted for Trump. So, you know, I asked him, like, is it possible you'll do the same thing this time? And he he left some wiggle room. He said, Mm -hmm. you know, I assume there is something he could do. And then he kind of joked, if he shoots a guy on Fifth Avenue, you know, maybe that'll do. But but like that to me, maybe I'm reading too much into this, but that to me suggested that he might not be 100 percent committed to this plan, Mm -hmm. you know, like. That I think that there is a scenario where we get into the final stretch of the campaign. Trump starts to ratchet up the rhetoric, starts to do some really kind of outlandish, outrageous things as he is wont to do. And Cox decides he just can't quite stomach voting for Trump and realizes that the project has failed. I give any politician credit when they genuinely change their mind or admit to a mistake. So I think he, you know, people should give him some grace if he decides to do that. I, but I think it's also possible he'll stay the course and, and keep on working at it. I don't know if he's disappointed in himself. I do know a lot of people are disappointed in him. And I, I, I understand that. I don't think it's my role as a journalist to try to pass judgment on, on him. Uh, Instead, you know, I just try to do my best to understand his thinking and then kind of present it to the world. And, the reactions I've gotten to the piece, including from people who uh, know him and, and feel like they've been, you know, allies and supporters of his, is that that you know they feel like they got to the end of the piece and they don't, they still don't understand why he endorsed Trump. Hmm. Um, and and I think that that sentiment has been uh, pretty prevalent among people who who like and admire him. Okay, final thing. What happens to the letter? So it was supposed to be hand delivered to Donald Trump. Did did it get to him? Did he see it? Did he respond? Do we know? He did read it. Um, I I'm told, and he uh, has, as far as I know, he has not uh, spoken to Cox and Trump. Have not spoken, although Trump is planning to come to Utah and for a fundraiser. And uh, my understanding is that they're going to try to make time to meet uh, while he's there. But the the letter the letter is in Donald Trump's possession. Hmm. Um, it also, you know, I think it's worth noting, leaked pretty quickly to <laughs> uh, the Deseret News, um, uh, w- which uh, I think set. And I, I don't think it leaked from Spencer Cox's camp. So that you know, just a general note of caution for anybody who plans to try to write a private letter to Donald Trump. You can. Uh, can expect that that's a pretty leaky operation. There's there's a good chance that uh, that that'll end up in the media somehow. McKay Coppins, thanks very much. Thanks, Doug. 
That's McKay Coppins. He's a staff writer for The Atlantic. His article is called The Last Man in America to Change His Mind About Trump. You can find a link to it on our website, RadioWest.org. Radio West is a production of KUER. You can subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. And we're on YouTube at KUER 90.1. You can email us with comments or suggestions. We're at RadioWest at KUER.org. Stevie Shaughnessy is our intern. The program produced by Benjamin Bombard and Tim Slover. Kerry Watson is our executive producer. I'm Doug Fabrizio.